mini course. So uh, this is the final lecture. Uh, and this is a quick reminder of uh, something I um, said uh, yesterday um, about what sort of methods uh, are typically used in the subject of homogenization, which is all about determining this uh, matrix A form, uh, at least in the kind of setting that we have been talking so far about. So um, towards the end of this lecture, there will be a more sort of more generalized, more general version of this object. And I will argue that uh, homogenization has kind of expanded its boundaries over the last few years to include um, situations that are not even uh, possible to treat at least directly with um, with uh, most of these methods. And actually, the method that I will kind of promote is uh, this. Uh, well, at least from the point of view of uh, how to understand the um, asymptotics, right, for the problems involved. So we want to uh, talk about some sort of measure of uh, closeness of the original problems and the problem that we want to propose as an effective, effective problem under this process of under this procedure of organization. So this is, this is the goal, is to produce some kind of effective problem. Uh, and the subject here in, the, that in this classical context where these methods have been applicable, have been applied, um, does exactly that. So sometimes this matrix is referred to as the effective matrix. So one uh, simple way of looking at this is basically think about the um, very heterogeneous medium. Imagine you, I mean, you can, well, you can draw a picture like this, and then, well, imagine the whole uh, uh, board covered with this, with the squares, and then if you move, if you move uh, further and further away from it, it looks more and more homogeneous, right? So uh, something similar happens in homogenization. We uh, want to uh, feel, to make this, to think of a medium, which looks like this with some uh, inclusions possibly of um, a material different to the material outside. And then we want to replace this somehow by a homogeneous medium, which is described precisely by this a form. And uh, there are two sort of uh, uh, different groups of approaches. Uh, one is what I refer to as stationary uh, techniques, and they typically work on a, or are applied on a bounded region. And uh, we talk about equilibria rather than sort of waves propagating. And I went over the uh, energy method by Murray and Tartar, goes back to the 1970s um, yesterday. So basically, all of these methods, they kind of uh, they're kind of based on a sort of compactness argument, and that's why we want to go for the bounded region as well. But of course, there is some interplay between the two as well. Uh, it's not this separation is not strict. And then non-stationary methods that uh, well, or ones that I refer to as non-stationary, they are uh, the ones that um, are relevant, perhaps most relevant in the context of wave propagation. And this this is the kind of methods that belong to the realm of spectral analysis, if you like. So, but I would like to argue that, that both, they kind of benefit both sides, both stationary and non-stationary, they benefit from, um, from this method that, is, method that is perhaps my favorite, um, or well, has been favorite uh, uh, throughout my work in the subject. So, and this is the method of asymptotic expansions. Um, so it kind of spans the two the two sides, and I'll put here two scale, but we will see that uh, maybe this is too restrictive to think about it like this. So um, I will start with an with an with uh, with an example of how a two so-called two what, what, what uh, that shows what a two scale expansion is. 
and how it works and how we get again to the same object. So we've seen how to do it by the energy method and I will now show uh, how it comes up in via an asymptotic expansion and it will be a two scale expansion in some sense. But, um, but actually thinking about it maybe a bit wider, still in the context of asymptotic expansions, but not necessarily taking what is called the two scale, two scale ansatz, remember the word ansatz. Um, and that will come, that will be the last part of uh, my course, really, uh, barring a quick um, run through the, well, the, the brief discussion of the most recent results where the more general object than this images. So, and uh, so thinking why that uh, in the synthetic expansion sort of context is, is, um, is actually quite, uh, quite useful and delivers you precisely this. And this is what we're after eventually when we want to uh, study waves. Uh, I hope I have argued to some extent uh, for that, right? So we want to uh, uh, understand how operators, operators of our problems behave. I haven't said what operator norm means, uh, and I won't, uh, because th there isn't enough time. But um, well, there will be a statement where, uh, which which will involve an operator norm, but. Uh, I won't necessarily expect you to uh, understand in detail what, what that means. So just, uh, just that there is some norm that measures the distance between operators. Okay, and, and it's, it's somehow the fact that, the, that that distance is small justifies our derivation of the effective problem. Uh, okay, so I'll, with this I'll I'll get going with uh, with the method of two scale asymptotic expansions. Um, still uh, in the context of the of the of the left side of this board, right? So we're looking at a well, actually, actually no. I'm I'm gonna look. I'm gonna think about a. You can think about the context of a bounded and bounded region, but uh, not necessarily. Uh, we'll just look. What we'll do is, I will pose a problem, a boundary value problem. I will, I will just write the equation, the equation that we have been looking at throughout, from the beginning, and I will just try to put these two scale ansatz into it and to show that uh, this object in form appears from it, uh, maybe not as soon as quickly as it was in the case of the energy method, but but also fairly, fairly quickly, right? By a nice argument where, by a nice procedure where you don't have to really, you almost don't have to think, right? You just, just put the expansion into the equation and, and, let, it, and let it work out by itself. So, so this is the equation that we have come to, remember. So uh, we have a two component medium, and we have the non dimensional version now of the original problem. So, by the time we have reached this problem, we have denoted the unknown function by W, and uh, the, the independent variable by X tilde, so the spatial variable. Um, so, you can you can think about it in the whole space or on a bounded domain, doesn't really matter for what I would like to show. So, uh, so let's formally, so this is the method. Let's formally set, formally see the solution, which obviously depends on epsilon and on the data. So this is the right hand side, right? So the data of the problem uh, or well, you, you can say that this is external forces. Right? External forces, or density of external forces, rather. Um, so the solution depends on this F, and given F, we somehow determine W subject, of course, to some boundary conditions. But uh, I um, want. Um, Involve that into the into what's coming in the in the next few minutes. So, 
So seek the, 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 the solution in the form in the form. So just let's take this ansatz again. Okay, okay. So So what can we done with this? What have I done with what? Uh, oh, oh yeah that's right we, we are we're keeping z here that's fine with the frequency well it's uh, yeah. uh it's a is this what you mean well uh, it's fixed it could be one it could be anything you like so it's fixed to some value um non negative not well positive right so it can't depend on the time hmm? so it can't depend on the time I don't want to go into that right now. So okay. maybe it can for you at some point, but uh, we here we just want to see something. Uh, so it may it may depend on the silent, but it's a separate discussion. So so then okay. So let's take this. Oh, it's still there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, we can drop it, but I, I want to be consistent. I don't want anyone to ask later what happened. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so it's the non-dimensional x. Still. So, so, so let's let's plug this into the equation and let's see what let's see what happens, right? Uh, what are these functions? These are functions of. Uh, of uh, x tilde, uh, obviously, and uh, of this another variable, which we may refer to as the fast variable, if you like, because epsilon is small, or is implied to be small, and eventually will go to zero. And this is oscillating rapidly, right, with respect to this variable. So uh, I will be assuming that wj are periodic, periodic with respect to so wj of xy are periodic. Uh, with respect to y. Okay, so then, and that's, I'm gonna start writing non stop. Um, you'll have to either believe me to some extent or uh, try, well, it's not a, a, a very challenging exercise, I would say, to think about what will happen if we differentiate this. We need to take the gradient, so you would differentiate with respect to this variable. Then with respect to this variable, and you would get one over epsilon pop out. Um, then you would multiply by this coefficient. You differentiate again, and again, you differentiate with respect to x tilde, uh, and then plus the derivative with respect to the second variable, which also is present here, and another one over epsilon will pop out. So, uh, you know, and that result of this is that we are gonna uh, have a long expression. Um, in powers of epsilon starting with the power of epsilon to the minus two. So I'm putting together the, all the terms with the same power of epsilon. And actually the first one is uh, the first uh, expression involves just one term. Okay. Then the second one uh, Power epsilon to the minus one involves uh, three terms. Okay. Uh, uh, minus the gradient, so similar the term similar to this, but but with the W one. Okay, then the term with epsilon to the minus two, uh, sorry, we come with epsilon to the power zero. It's gonna be even longer, but that gonna, that's gonna be it. So we'll only need that uh, to extract a form. So we have, still, still there. Not minus uh, x tilde a of y prime y times the not and minus prime y 
So swapping now, that y dot a of y that x that will be not uh, oh should be w one yes, sorry of course w one and then minus grad x still the grad 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 y dot a y grad y w two okay and that's it so then I have epsilon plus and so on, right so and this is equal to f so starting from here and then continuing there so what do we have now here so on the right we have a function of x tilde right and it's of order epsilon to the power zero so this must be zero in order for this if we hope uh, that this um, um, function satisfies this equation the, the equation that was written here uh, a couple of minutes ago this due to the ellipticity of the matrix A will imply that W0 does not actually depend on X still then, on, sorry, on Y. It doesn't depend on the second variable. It only depends on X still then, right? So let, let me write this on, let me write this in more, in more detail. So, so if minus, so if minus divergence A of Y, W greater, W naught equals zero. Then I can multiply. So I can I can multiply by the uh, by the test function phi and integrate uh, over over the unit cell, right? So remember the unit cell is our period, right? So this is what we label by this by the symbol. So we integrate with respect to so multiply by a test function, integrate, uh, integrate by pass due to periodicity. This is written as a of y grad y w naught uh, grad dot grad phi. Now I take phi to be just w naught simply here, right? In particular, so this is true for any phi. I put the phi equals w naught, and that gives me. Uh, uh, that that the integral of a of y grad w naught dot grad w naught, which by ellipticity is not less than the ellipticity constant, right? So what uh, bounds below all eigenvalues of a times the integral of the grad w naught squared. And, and this is zero, and this is non negative, so that must be zero. So W naught is a constant in Y. So it doesn't depend on Y. It's a function of X tilde only. And we crucially use the ellipticity here. So uh, there is a, that is that, that there is a constant that independently of Y bounds below all eigenvalues of A. So that's going to be important. When we move on to more general uh, uh, kind of uh, problems to which this method would not be applicable as we are discussing now, but uh, it would have to be revised, right? And mm, new features would emerge because of that. In particular, W naught will not be independent of Y anymore. It will depend on both X tilde and X tilde over epsilon. So, okay, so the first coefficient in this expansion is a function of wx of uh, x tilde only. So, so this guy, I can, I, I can throw it away uh, because there's a gradient which is zero. I know, yeah, right? So now the, the fact that the second term has to be zero, it's remember it's power epsilon to the, to the minus one, and I still have. I still have, I, I still, have, I mean, it, I, I again have to say that it's zero because uh, the right hand side has the lowest order of the right hand side is epsilon to the zero. So, and naturally, this gives me an equation for W1. 
And this is exactly the, the, the equation that I had for that function and psi. Remember that I introduced yesterday. So we had this equation um, divergence of uh, A drive and psi plus psi equals zero. So you will recognize here exactly that equation. Only that the role of psi is played by this gradient. Right? So if I I can write uh, I can write it as drag uh, y dot a of y drag w one here uh, plus that guy. So this is okay. I can put them together like this. It's exactly the same equation. I'll drop this. So, so actually, I know. So I'll introduce these functions, and I'm gonna actually use uh, um, three functions: m1, m2, and m3, such that m psi is m1 times psi1 plus m2 times psi2 plus m3 times psi3. So this this m psi is obviously linear m psi. So you can always write it like this. Then these three functions in one and two and three don't depend on psi. And then w1. So from here, w1 is of it depends on x and but x tilde n y. Um, and this is this is then uh, the sum of n j of y um, times the derivative of w naught respect to xj over all j. So I actually get a formula plus plus a constant, right? But I I'll, I'll I'll make sure now at this point I require that these functions have uh, first of all they have mean zero so I can extract them in a unique way. I can define them in a unique way and and uh, well I mean in principle you you can keep this this constant here, but uh, um, it turns out that if you go into the higher orders, it turns out that without loss of generality, you can actually set it to zero at this point. So it will happen to be. Uh, I mean, it can it, it can be. Yeah, it's it, it it will happen that it's possible to to set it to zero and uh, uh, and 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 get a valid expansion. Okay, so yes, uh, if I understand that correctly, isn't it one of these things where if you do not make it zero, it will just contribute to another smaller order um, solution of the same kind to the whole thing, right? I mean, it's kind of independent of all the other coefficients that you would solve along the way, right? Right. You want an explanation of why I can get rid of it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, we can, I, we can discuss it. I mean, I could have just, I could have just sought the solution in this form, right? But uh, yeah, um, yeah. So, so, and then finally, if I substitute now. Um, Okay, so so I have now the condition the requirement that this term, this term here, equals equals the right hand side f, right? So this is my next order equation, and I will treat it as an equation in y. Okay, so remember, I treated each 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 equation as an equation in y. So the first equation was an equation in y on w naught. The second one, an equation in y in w1. Uh, this is an equation, this, this can be treated as an equation in the variable y um, for, on w2. And the condition that 
it's uh, solvable, this equation is, uh, well, one condition it turns out to be necessary and sufficient is that when I multiply by a constant everywhere in the unit cell and integrate by parts, I must have a consistent, uh, I must get the true equality, right? So integrating by parts with, uh, after multiplying by constant, uh, we'll get rid of this term. It will get rid of this term as well. And then I will be left with the condition that uh, the integral over the unit cell of minus grand x tilde dot a of y grand x tilde w naught plus grand x tilde divergence x tilde a of y grand y w one say uh, minus okay. And now, if I use the expression for W1 that I found previously, I get exactly, well, this is again a quick exercise. I get, I get minus around X, uh, divergence X tilde, A form, uh, grad X tilde, W naught, plus F. So, hmm? A comp as we defined it last time. Yes, and it was also mentioned at the bottom of this of the diagram that I presented first. Right? So I can recall what they call is a home side is the mean of uh, A uh, graph and sign plus sign. Okay, so we've uh, killed two birds with, uh, with one stone. So we've looked at uh, how two scalar functions work uh, or may work. Um, and also we've re-derived the homogenized equation. So this can all be made rigorous, but then you have to set up the boundary conditions and you know, uh, be more careful uh, about what you do, of course, because uh, to get estimates, you would need to have a proper setup. Okay, so so uh, uh, what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to try and see uh, how we can get using the idea of asymptotic expansions, but maybe without the word to scale how we can get estimates that are better, much better than the kind of information that we got from the energy method yesterday, which was just uh, convergence in some sense of variational problems in some weak sense. And the convergence of solutions was weak as well, weak in H1, strong in L2, but we didn't have any quantitative estimates on that convergence. So, so, so far, so far, uh, the normal the difference uh, between W, so with a W epsilon, right? And, and W naught. Uh, so we don't have any estimates. We don't even know if uh, if this goes to zero. So, well, it's a question mark. Okay. So uh, you can imagine that with the method of asymptotic expansions that I have presented right now, uh, provided it is you know supplemented with the rigorous with the rigorous setup and the rigorous argument, I can actually get an estimate on the on the norm, the norm in L2, uh, whatever in the L2 on the region where we expand or in the whole space. I can I can get something something like that, but uh, this estimate will still depend on the data f. And actually, it turns out that um, we can. By, by, by refining the approach, by using a more refined version of asymptotic expansions, not necessarily to scale anymore, but uh, something that is equivalent to that and stronger. Uh, or there is now two or three other methods that can do the same. Um, we can actually show the, uh, that, that W epsilon minus W naught is bounded Again, under an appropriate uh, for an appropriately set up problem, 
can be bounded by constant times epsilon times the norm of f in two. And this is what I actually mean by operator norm, right? So this is operator norm. So this is our goal in a sense in what in the, over the next 10 15 minutes uh, I can try yeah so we have another one. okay and in order to in order in order to get this kind of estimate to get to be more precise about these sort of things. I need to invoke the machinery that Steven uh, has been introducing us to. So, um, so I would like to, I would like to um, now consider the operator. I've used the word operator a few times and I, I realize that for many of you, it still has to come as a kind of a, vague and not strictly defined idea. But um, I think if you just think about it as a kind of um, action of a differential expression onto, uh, onto a function and uh, on a function and uh, perhaps with uh, some boundary conditions appropriately taken into account. So it's an action, right? It's an action of a function that produces the right hand side. So that's an operator. So, and we're interested in the solution operator, which gives us the solution from the data. The solution operator or the resolvent from the word to resolve, to solve, right? So we are interested in the resolvent of this uh, operator, which I'm gonna denote the epsilon. And I'm gonna put on purpose the operator in quotes because we haven't defined it uh, appropriately. Um, so the problem is uh, the one that we have been looking at after non-dimensionalizing. So, right. <clears throat> so, so, so that, so that, so that uh, W epsilon is a epsilon plus z identity inverse f on QNF. Okay, so that so that solving the problem is actually writing the resolvent of that operator. This is the resolvent for those people who uh, well can think of their um, who are familiar with this uh, with this term. Okay, and and Stephen Stephen introduced us to a theory. The uh, uh, Floquet block Gilfam theory, which which allows me to write this operator, this resolvent, as a direct integral up to a unitary transform, uh, which I be, uh, which in my context will be the Gilfam transform, as so, um, as the direct integral, direct integral. Over, so I'll, I'll clarify what this means. So, so this is a this is a dual domain. Uh, uh, well, Stephen had it in his in his lectures. So, in my context, it will take a specific shape. So, in theta, uh, here I have on the right I apply first the Gilfan transform that will depend on epsilon. On the left, on the left. Uh, well, actually, yeah, actually, my Gilfan transform, uh, the way it is up here, it is not, it is not dependent on epsilon. So it's just G, the Gilfan, the Gilfan transform, and G star on the left. So we apply Gilfan transform, we have in the middle, we can look, you know, we, we, we represent our problem as a, uh, Family of problems now on a unit cell. So uh, we now put the unit cell prime here because this is what it is the unit cell prime. So uh, the unit cell prime is the dual cell. So my cell 
my cell is 0, 1 cubed, and the dual cell is uh, from minus 5 to 5 cubed. Okay, so this is epsilon inverse times, so epsilon inverse times this is epsilon inverse times it's a large cell. It's large because because uh, my the cell of periodicity on which I work in this problem becomes small. So when that gets small, the dual cell becomes large. It's kind of divided here. So the product of the size of the actual physical cell and the dual cell, it has to stay constant. Okay, so, so I use this, I use this kind of representation and uh, instead of thinking, instead of working with that guy, which is my ultimately my goal to get quantitative estimates uh, on the behavior of W epsilon solutions, that is of the resolvent, right, um, to this problem, I will be working with these resolvents. And then uh, once I have obtained estimates for that, I will apply the Ginfan transform. I will just sandwich it by the Ginfan transform, which is something I know very well, right? And, and Stephen uh, introduced it for, for us. So GW, the Ginfan transform. Uh, is So kappa, the variable kappa will live in this uh, dual cell. Okay, so, uh, and actually the variable that lives here, I will denote it by theta. So uh, the Ginfan transform of the function W is a function of Y, which lives in the original in the original cell, and kappa, which lives in the dual cell. And it is what Stephen uh, showed. So, okay. Uh, we make a periodic version, a periodic kind of function, a periodic function out of a out of our function W, and this is this is done for any W uh, in um, in L two form. This is R three actually, right? So we got in R three form. Okay, so. So I said that I'm going to be working with these resolvents, uh, parameterized, of course, now by, by these guys. So remember, this is kappa, which is epsilon times theta. So kappa is epsilon times theta. The two versions of the dual variable in a non-rescale non and in a rescale set. Oh, so yeah, thanks. So, uh, yeah, so my question is what is that? Z, Z, just that. Yeah. Yeah, like it. Yeah, but uh, this is. I'm trying to avoid this discussion again about about uh, the factor. So 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 actually, this is the sort of thing that I could replace by one over epsilon squared a, which I introduced last time, plus z i inverse. But then I would have to put epsilon to the to the, to the three parts. So you can do it that way. You can write it like that way. But this way, I just thought, okay, I'll write this problem. And I'll introduce the super rate A episode for the time. So, okay. So, uh, so we're going to be working with, with the problems whose resolvents are written here. So, what are those problems? These, these are problems on, on, On the cell, uh, sorry, on this cell, right? On the cell where Y lives. So here they are. And for the solution, I will add an extra label theta. 
because now uh, there is an extra parameter. That's why I said about the family of problems. So for each theta, I have a problem. I could have written here kappa, of course, but it's not, uh, it's, it, it would be the same. But I would actually like to keep it as epsilon theta because of the way the method works. So in terms of writing it right now, it doesn't matter. But, uh, uh, but for me, it's more convenient to keep to keep uh, theta, to keep it in this form. Uh, the dual is dual variable, not at this point. Okay, so okay, so f this f represents is just is just a corresponding uh, fiber of the Gilfan transform of the right hand side low case f. I could put the uh, theta here. So and now, well, I have only one scale now. But the parameter and the, as, a, as a price for dropping the, the other scale. So remember, I had I had the scale of x tilde, the scale of x tilde over epsilon, uh, sort of slow, slow and fast. Now I have done the Gilfan transform. I kind of I still have the fast variable which comes in the guise of y, and uh, the information about the slow scale has kind of gone into this dependence on theta. So this is this is where the the, the information about the steel is hidden. So of course I haven't lost anything, but uh, the technique is gonna be now just using, if you like, classical uh, power series expansions for this problem. Only that they will be parameterized by by theta. So it's convenient for me to parameterize them by theta, even though theta lives in an ever increasing cell. So maybe it's not the only way to do of doing it. I, I don't know, but this is this is my my chosen way of doing it. Okay, so so and here I'm gonna write an answer again. So it's already the third or fourth time that I'm using this word here. So 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 answer. Um, oh um, okay, so so actually, yeah, that's fine. So 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 answer. Ansatz again. Uh, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look at a kind of power series ansatz with terms dependent on theta. So, so I'm gonna label an approximating approximating function by d. So this will turn out to be close to w eventually. And consider um, consider this. So this is an ansatz that um, I have actually worked out by uh, playing around with power series expansion. So I'm not being completely fair here. I have gone beyond the point of using an ansatz. I have actually done some playing with ansatz, ansatz, and I have come up with this formula as a result. And this formula will go, I know that. So, but it's still a kind of ansatz, right? It's still, it's still a form of, the, of my approximation. Um, where so what are these C, C, C theta? So NJ we're familiar with we 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 just had NJ right and so this is sorry there is a there is a summation here summation with respect to J so so this is N one and two and three these are the coefficients in that M psi M psi was N one psi one plus N two psi two plus N three psi three. Okay, so I'm going to say what C theta is and what R epsilon theta is. So C theta is C theta is the integral over F theta divided by theta dot A of theta plus one. Uh, R epsilon theta solves uh, a problem. Special problem minus the drag plus i epsilon theta. So there were kind of divergent, shifted divergence. Um, dot a drag plus i epsilon theta, uh, r epsilon theta plus epsilon squared, the integral of one. This is an important term that took me a while to spot. Um, so I knew that. The mean of R epsilon theta should play a role, but I didn't know how to exactly incorporate it. So, but this is the way 
done. And then there is some right hand side, which, okay, has quite a bit of detail in it, but you know, just some function that you obtain basically uh, in analogy to uh, the sort of uh, uh, terms in the equation for W2 that we wrote in the two scale expansion. It's the same kind of stuff. But here I'm just I'm doing it just for, for a standard power series expansion, not for a two scale expansion. So, so I have some I have some uh, terms here, which actually uh, I don't need to write them right now. They won't make that much sense anyway. But they they depend on everything that we already know. So this is FB. And actually, um, well, this is something that I don't know by uh, H epsilon theta. And the equation, the way the equation is understood, is that for, for any test function phi, uh, the integral of drag plus i epsilon theta, uh, so a, uh, the integral of a drag plus i epsilon theta r epsilon theta. Um, Grad plus i epsilon theta phi bar. Well, actually, if I put a dot here and I understand the inner product as it should be, I don't need to put the bar. So it's just the inner product and c. Um, plus epsilon squared, the integral of r epsilon theta dot the integral of phi equals, and uh, again, for those familiar, you will know what I'm talking about, but if you if this is too obscure, please ignore it. So this is the action of this. This, this will turn out to be a function in h minus one, and this so function now acting in five by the duality. This is the duality between h minus one and h one. Okay, so but uh, you can ignore that. Basically, some right hand side the action of the data some for this problem. Okay, so so now I have I have a theorem. And I'm not gonna go into how I proved it, but but you can what <laughs> so so um, so the estimate the estimate on r epsilon theta, right? So r epsilon theta minus the mean is bounded by c times the normal f theta, and the mean I also have control of the mean. It is C over epsilon norm of F. So uh, the norms here are in O2 on the cell. So I get I get the kind of estimates that I'm actually after because, because remember I wanted to estimate the, the operator norm, right? So I want so so in particular I want to see how the norm of the difference between the solution and its approximation. Uh, is bounded by by the data by the by the norm of the data on the right hand side. So this is this is where the, what the data have been converted into. So I'm estimating the norm in L2 by the norm in L2, the, the error in L2 by the uh, by the norm of the data. Okay, so so much time. Left. So okay, ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, right. So, so a corollary of this. Then I'm almost done with the with the techniques of this. The proof of this theorem is basically a uh, careful use of uh, power C of um, well, a careful substitution of the ansatz, what the, what I wrote here as an ansatz, uh, in terms of epsilon and theta, and you know, uh, estimating. It's actually estimating R epsilon theta. So that's that's all that uh, you would need to do at this point. Okay, so so as a corollary, uh, we get the W epsilon minus W naught. Uh, w core, right? Okay, W core in L2 on RD. Is bounded by C epsilon. This is exactly what we need. Where W comb solves the problem 
So we home source it for the problem minus divergence A4 around W4 equals that. So I've managed to produce, well, maybe not completely in complete detail, but somehow convince you three times already uh, why. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for getting this. Of course, yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is, by the way, this is a. Uh, the proof can be found in my in a joint paper with uh, with uh, my former PhD student Serena and Donofrio. So, actually, Igor and I we also since then developed a somewhat similar approach, but but he's, in, he, he's going to talk about that. So, and you will see. I think I think you should get an idea of how to do it in a in a fourth way, <laughs> uh, right? So every every time you end up with this equation. Okay, uh, right, so, so the final part of my course will be what happens if I relax the condition of uniform electricity, right? So, so far we have used, remember that the crucial estimate, I mean, I understand this in the matrix sense, right? So, so this is identity, okay? So all eigenvalues are bounded below uniformly in Y by some constant. So, so now suppose that suppose that uh, square root of mu over mu one, which I will label by delta, is is a small quantity. Okay. So uh, what do I mean by small? Um, it, will, it will go to zero. Uh, simultaneously with that, so. okay. So I would like to kind of relax the condition of uniform electricity and see what sort of uh, effective problems I may obtain as a result. And I want to be complete, very precise quantitatively. So I don't want to go into the realm of um, compensated compactness, we are method. I want to get a very common estimate because that will be you know, solid, a solid proof that I have got the kind of answer where I have convergence of spectra, that the waves, you know, convergence of the, the exponential groups of the operator, which, will, which means essentially the uh, convergence of solutions to the hyperbolic problem, the original wave equation. So, So, uh, so let's go back to the yeah. So let's go back to the uh, eigenvalue equation just for a second, for a, for, a, for a minute, right? So, so, so go back. So we've seen we've worked maybe throughout the whole lecture and a half, at least we have worked with the resolvent problem. But I started with the kind of eigenvalue problem, right? I derived originally by non-dimensionalizing. So let's go back to that. To, to the eigenvalue problem or eigenvalue equation. I'm not uh, worrying about boundary conditions. So, so this is what we have. Uh, originally, right? So uh, before we non-dimensionalize it. So this is where X was. <laughs> so dropping a tilde uh, 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 would play a bad joke with me at this point. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so this is the original, the original X. And uh, now I'm gonna do what I uh, gave you as an exercise in lecture one. Um, it was a, a kind of note in passing slash exercise. I said that if you now non-dimensionalize by uh, the length, the wavelength, in one of the regions, in one of the in one of the components. So, and I'm going to use it. I'm going to use the second component, the component with the wavelength number two. Remember, we have we have mu one, mu two. So now the ratio is small, 
and uh, lambda two is the web, uh, wavelength in lambda two in in this one. So I'm going to non-dimensionalize using this, this and using uh, this uh, scaling. And well, I'm going to skip the details because I'm running out of time. So it will be, I guess, it will stay an exercise effectively. But um, but I will I will uh, well, it's a straightforward thing to do actually. It's uh, three lines, right? And we've done this we've done this when we introduced uh, um, that reference length scale capital L that I did uh, for talking about wave packets, right? So, so, so I actually uh, spelled out the answer to this process. And I said that when you do that, you get mu1 over mu2 here, uh, one x hat, uh, grad x uh, hat w hat equals w, Oh yeah, so it's let's write it first with epsilon. So x over epsilon w w right w x x tilde x tilde equals w right. And I, I promised I said when we did when when I mentioned it that that uh, we will get just one here. So so this, the value of the spectral parameter is just one because because I. I did the rescaling, but by the by the wavelength in the medium by which I derive here, by which by post mu I derive here, and all the bits and pieces are all omega squared mu two lambda two. When they come together here, and combine with z, they will give me one simply. So actually, it's a nice illustration of why what actually to what value z uh, uh, we fit, what value z we fix in the result, and doesn't really matter. <laughs> I mean, it's a kind of indirect indication of the same. So, all that matters is that is, uh, is what happens with z equal to one. Uh, okay, we will. That's 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 if we want to go into the other regimes. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> it's not. It's uh, so there are. Uh, Sasha is thinking about high frequency regimes when we do want to couple z to uh, to, to epsilon. Okay. So now, what I'm going to do? So, 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 uh, mu one over mu two is. Oh, what's what's this? Sorry, I apologize. I was too rushing too much. So this is mu square root of mu one over mu two. So this is this is delta squared. And I'm going to couple now. I'm going to link together epsilon and delta. So I'm going to write. So I have two. I have one more parameter, delta, as a result. Of this of this assumption, so and I'm gonna I'm gonna link link uh, it with epsilon so that they go to zero simultaneously. So I'm gonna say so I'm gonna set yeah, set now um, epsilon squared equals delta to some power alpha z. And actually, I'm gonna bring the spectral parameter back now like this. Okay, so z is just some it's just some fixed number. You could put z equal to one if you like, but you can. Um, actually, <laughs> that mean that 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 shows that your comment was not particularly relevant, anyway. Because when we couple when we couple when we couple z to epsilon, we will couple z to epsilon after we have done this, right? So z z z will be there in a second. So so in particular, I'm going to focus on this on this uh, situation. Alpha equals two. Yes. You have just spells all that. You have just spells yeah, but I'm, I'm I'm free to introduce any that I like. I think. Okay, it's my regime. So okay, so so alpha equals two. Let's consider this case. Fine. It's still a number. I mean, it's a number. I like. I can call it by the same letter. It's a number. Because I have non dimensionalized. Sure, sure. So, uh, so, so, so I now have this, 
right? So I, 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 um, oh, what's happening? So, uh, sorry about that. There is no one on Webson Square here because I'm still with X tilde. But if I go to the, if I go to X hat, which is X tilde over epsilon, I end up with this. And W hat is X hat is W uh, epsilon X hat. So I get a new, well, an equivalent equation. Right, with Z as such I wish. Okay, and so this, like uh, in lecture one, it motivated me, the eigenvalue problem motivated me to consider a resolvent. This will now motivate me, will motivate me to consider the resolvent of this, of this operator, the operator represented by this left hand side. So, so I'll just say that this motivates, because I will want to consider wave packets in a medium with, with contrast, with small delta. And well, if you like by that uh, argument that to, 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 to trace wave packets, we need to look at the resolvent. We start looking at the resolvent here as well. And we will be asking exactly the same questions, namely, in particular, the question of operator norm convergence. Uh, it will turn out that actually the convergence will need to be replaced by asymptotics. There will be no convergence anymore, but rather an asymptotics okay. because of the contrast. Yeah. So, so this motivates uh, uh, studying uh, the operator of asymptotics. Of uh, for for for, for uh, the sequence of problems for the uh, epsilon parameterized uh, problems. Minus one over epsilon squared. So I'm going to replace now delta by epsilon. So uh, epsilon squared one, run x and w and equals okay plus z w and equals f, where f is again some arbitrary function of two over one d. Okay, and I'll just state. Conclude. I'll just say the, say the result of what one gets when does when, the, when one does the analysis. But uh, the analysis is can be done along a number of lines. Uh, it has so far been been done along one line, but I believe it can be done along the lines of the um, sort of asymptotic expansion that I used in the non-contrast case. We used a completely different method for 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 proving the result that I'm about to state. Uh, which is not in method number six, also something that I recall in particular. Uh, okay, so so the result is this. So what we have now, we have we have uh, this medium where we have inclusions with properties mu one and mu two. This is the original medium, right? Mu uh, mu one mu two mu one mu two and so on. Okay, so uh, so this this has period T, right? But of course, of course, I get uh, after scaling after non-dimensionalizing. I get uh, epsilon as the period. And also after non-dimensionalizing, I'm gonna have uh, this region. So I need to label it somehow. The region uh, outside this inclusion. So the region filled with the material with the property mu2. So I'm gonna label it as my omega epsilon state. So 
the, the, rot the, the reason for the rotative is because sort of in the elastic con context, now the inclusions are kind of soft because we want to be too small. And the medium outside is stiff, right? So that's why the corresponding region is omega epsilon, omega epsilon stiff after non-dimensionalization. So, and also I will need to think about the unit cell where I have this region Q soft and Q stiff. So just some some notation, right? So I need I need some notation in order to state the result. Uh, So, so, uh, so, so, so the result is that suppose, suppose that the distance of Q soft to the boundary of the, this unit cell is positive. Okay, so we have proper inclusions. Uh, so we don't have, you know, we don't have something like this here. We just have, let's say, balls or something that are uh, embedded into the cell. So it would be in 3D, it isn't 3D, in fact, in our case. Right? So um, then um, the norm, the operator norm uh, of the difference. So I'm going to write the operator say epsilon that I introduced um, earlier on, but uh, now mu one and mu two. So mu one or mu two is epsilon squared. So I have the resolvent um, restricted to the L two on this omega epsilon stick. And then I have to project onto uh, onto L two on omega epsilon stick. Yeah. So it's a kind of sandwich that uh, Sasha mentioned in his talk yesterday. So this is this is I'm afraid this is the only link to generalized resolvents that we will have in my mini course, but at least once I have mentioned. Um, so and then I have here I have uh, divergence of a form. Um, right, but instead of Z, I have what one expects if one has a, a generalized resolvent present, namely a function of Z, some function of Z that is found explicitly, and just well, just some magnets, uh, uh, theta, theta, and theta star. So theta is just uh, well, it's a bit like it's a bit like uh, a Gelfand transform, if you like. Yeah, the dot gauge was used by uh, Stephen. Yeah. So 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 theta is a it's a unitary uh, operator uh, between so from from L two on R D to L two on omega epsilon c. Okay, so this difference as an operator from L2 to L2. So uh, okay, I could put the I could put the the, 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 the right hand side here F so that I don't have to do this. So this is bound by F, C epsilon the norm of F and L2. So this is exactly again the operator norm type estimate. But the interesting thing is that now instead of that, that I have this guy. And this guy is found explicitly. And this is Z over the uh, volume of QC. So the volume fraction. Um, one plus Z, the sum of for J from one to infinity ZJ minus Z inverse uh, modulus of uh, the integral over Q soft of phi j. So in the last thing for, for me to that remains for me to say is what zj and phi j are. So so where zj and phi j are the eigenvalue eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of uh, 
the minor surplus operator on your soul uh, with the directly bound operations. Okay, so this is it. Thank <laughs> you.